Okay, here are the answers to Rookie Quiz 5. Question 1. One out. Runners at second and third. Batter hits a grounder to the third baseman who gets R3 in a rundown between third and home. R3 eludes a tag and returns to third safely. Meanwhile, R2 is standing on third also. Both are tagged out. Who is out? The correct answer is R2. The runner who occupied the base at the time of the pitch is the last one legally entitled to the base until he crosses his advanced base. So until that runner on R3 crosses home, he has the right to third base. Therefore, the backup, the, the trail runner, the runner from second, even though he's on the base, he's tagged out because he is not the legal occupant. Number two, one out, runner on first. Batter has a quick one hopper to the first baseman. R1 returns to first and is tagged while on the bag. The first baseman then steps on first. Who is out? This is one we've spoken about in class a couple times. Um, they are both out. So the answer is both R1 and the batter runner because he was not legally entitled to that bag because he was forced. So once he tagged him, even though he was standing on the base, he's out. Then he steps on first to record the force out on the batter runner. Had he stepped on the base first to record the out on the batter runner and then tagged R1 who was on the base, he would then be considered safe. Number three, true or false? Substitutions may be made while the ball is live. This is completely false. Substitutions can only be made during a timeout when the ball is dead. Number four, no outs. Base is loaded. The first baseman catches a foul fly and falls into the stands. Place R1, R2, and R3. Well, we know approaching dead ball territory, if the guy makes the catch in live ball territory and then loses his feet into dead ball territory, all runners that are currently on base advance one base. So, in this answer, every runner moves up one base. Number five, no outs, runner on first. R1 is stealing second when the batter bunts the ball to the third baseman. R1 is past second when the third baseman's throw goes to fir goes throw to first goes into the stands. Place R1 and the batter runner. Well, this is one of those you have to know whether it's two bases, time of throw, time of pitch. So because it's the first play on the infield, it's two bases, time of throw. However, it does say that the runner stealing was at second base at the time of the throw, which does not matter. The only way it would matter is if all runners, including the batter runner, safely achieved their next base. On this one, it doesn't say it, but we're going to assume that the batter runner was not yet at, had not yet achieved first base at the time the throw occurred. So even though the runner on set, uh, on even though the runner was at second at the time of the throw, it's dead. Uh, it's a dead ball, two bases from the time of the pitch. So the batter runner gets second, and R1 gets third. Number six, one out, runner on first who is attempting to steal second. The catcher interferes with the batter who strikes out and then throws out R1 at second base. What penalties do you impose? So the second you have the interference by the catcher, the plate ump is going to yell obstruction or catcher's interference. Catcher's interference is a delayed dead ball situation. Um, it's also an option play. The offensive team has the opportunity to take the action of the play or enforce the penalties of the interference. As an umpire, you don't let them know it. They have to know it. You just enforce the penalties. So as soon as the umpire calls catcher's interference, again, it's delayed dead ball. You wait to see what happens. As soon as that runner is put out at second base, it's timeout. The batter runner, even if he wouldn't have struck out, as soon as this catcher's interference gets awarded first base, and the runner from first then gets awarded second base. Number seven, a relief pitchers enter the game with two outs and a runner at first. Without delivering a single pitch, the new pitcher successfully picks off R1, thus retiring the side. The manager now inserts a pinch hitter for the reliever, who is due to lead off the next half inning. Is this legal? The answer is yes. Um, the, pitching rule the pitching change rule states that when a new pitcher is brought into the game, he has to face one batter or until the team is put out. Um, bear with me for a second. I have a copy of it. 
It won't fit in the box. There we go. It's rule 3.05. It says, if the pitcher is replaced, the substitute pitcher shall pitch to the batter then at bat or any substitute batter until such batter is put out or reaches first base or until the offensive team is put out. Unless the substitute pitcher sustains injury or illness, which in the umpire chief, the umpire in chief's judgment incapacitates him from further play. So because of this, he picked off the guy to end the inning. So he now met the minimum requirements that a relief pitcher must face. So yes, they can successfully pinch hit for him the next half inning. Number eight. Two outs, bases loaded, 3-2 count. With all runners going on the pitch, the batter takes ball four. R2 touches and rounds third, rounds third and is picked off by the catcher before the runner from third touches the plate. Does the run score? Now, everyone's instinct is going to say no because the guy rounded third, which is what he was entitled to, and then got picked off at third before the run crossed the plate. However, the run does score. It's, majorly, it's OBR uh, reference rule 7.0. 04B. Let's take a look at that. 7.04B, right here. Each runner, other than the batter, may without liability to be put out, advance one base when, here's B, the batter's advance without liability to put out forces the runner to vacate his base. Or when the batter hits a fair ball that touches another runner or the umpire before such ball has been touched by or has passed the fielder if the runner is forced to advance. Here's the, here's the casebook comment for 7.04b. A runner forced to advance without liability to be put out may advance past the base to which he is entitled to at his own peril. If such runner forced to advance is put out for the third out before the preceding runner, before a preceding runner also forced to advance such as home plate, the run shall score. Okay, so even though the out was recorded before he scored, he still scored. Um, in the case book, it gives a play right here. Play, two outs, bases full. It's the same one we just had. Batter walks, but runner from second is overzealous and runs past third base toward home and is tagged out on thrown by the catcher. Even, even, though there, even though two are out, the run would score on the theory that the run was forced home by the base on balls and that all runners needed to do so will proceed and touch the next base. Okay, so even though, again, even though he overran third and was tagged out before the run crossed, that runner was awarded home because of the base on balls. So in that question, the run shall score. Number nine, the pitcher balks, attempting to pick off R1 and throws the ball wild. R1 advances to third but missed second on the way. The defense throws to second and appeals to you. Is the runner out? Yes, the runner is out. Now, this de depending on what rule sets we're following here, right now we're going to talk about OBR. So, he attempts to pick him off, but balked. So, the ball is still live because in OBR, a balk is a delayed dead ball. Once that runner successfully made it past second base, the balk is off. So he missed second base. So they're appealing that he missed second, so he's out. Had the guy just stopped at second, there wouldn't have been an issue. But again, because he advanced one base, the balk is nullified. Um, if we were using high school rules, this could never happen because in high school, a balk is an immediate dead ball no matter what follows. I, I want to show you something from number nine. Um, here it is right here. Number nine, just like number eight, deals with, this is rule 7.04, but this is, this is the note to rule 7.04. When a runner is entitled to a base without liability to put out while the ball is in play or, any, or under any rule to which the ball is in play after the runner reaches the base to which he is entitled, and that runner fails to touch the base to which he is entitled before attempting to advance to the next base, the runner shall forfeit his exemption from liability to be put out and may be put out by tagging the base or by tagging the runner before he returns to that missed base. 
Um, this this applies to anything. Someone someone hits a ground rule double, they're awarded second base. They miss first base, even though he gets second base. They appeal that he missed first base, and the appeal is upheld. Just because he's entitled to something doesn't mean he gets an exemption from going through the necessary steps. He still has to touch every base. Okay, number 10. No outs. This called ball four and gets by the catcher and roll towards the first base dugout. As the catcher attempts to retrieve the ball, he inadvertently knocks the ball into the dugout. Place R2 and the batter. Well, this, even though the, the, the thrown ball or the pitch originated from the mound, <clears throat> Uh, this is a two-base award. You know, we've talked about in class how everything from the mound is one base. However, this doesn't count as a wild pitch that just sailed out of bounds. This falls under the category of a subsequent push. And a subsequent push we talked about in class is this exact situation. Wild pitch would have stayed in play while the catcher was going to retrieve it. He kicks it out of bounds. And the award for a subsequent pitch, uh, a subsequent push, is two bases at the time of the pitch. So the batter runner gets second, and the runner who is at second now gets home.